Good morning, everybody, and welcome to our IFRS webinar for July 2022. That's right, we're already in the second half of 2022, which is a little bit scary. I saw some photos recently of uh, Christmas in July, and, and I thought, oh, wow, uh, before we know it, it's going to be Christmas. So, as always, I've got Kevin Frobus with me. So, good morning, Kevin. Lovely to see you. Hello, Aleta, and it's good to see you again. You talk about Christmas. Well, it doesn't feel warm outside. It's freezing in Sydney, so I'm sure it's the same in Melbourne. I look forward to the real Christmas in December. Lovely to see you all again, and, and welcome to our July webinar. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I'm so happy to hear that it's cold in Sydney too, because we are freezing, uh, Kevin, in, in Melbourne. So today's ag agenda, we've got two big parts. The first part, uh, Kevin will talk about 10 practical tips on impairment testing. And I have to tell you, when he gave me his slides last night, I thought, wow, this is cool. I like the way he's packaged it, so I can't wait for the session myself. And then in the second part, um, unfortunately, you'll be stuck with me to talk about the impact of climate and sustainability factors and really a focus on what do we have to do around sustainability and climate change for our 30 June 2022 financial statements. We cannot ignore it. Um, there is some work to be done and it links with impairment testing uh, because it could have an impact. It could be an impairment indicator and often is an impairment indicator. But before um, I ramble uh, on, uh, I'll hand over to Kevin to talk about the impairment testing and he's starting off with the basics. Thanks, Aletta, and straight into it today. Um, and, and you're right, Aletta, the impact of climate and sustainability is absolutely connected. And as Aletta said, she'll look at that later. But as I go through the basics, just keep that in the back of your mind, knowing that it's coming, because I think you can already start to you know, imagine that climate and sustainability is going to impact cash flows and discount rates. You know, So it has a direct impact on impairment. So a letter will cover that off in a section at the end, but keep it in the back of your mind as I go through. I'm gonna do the section on the basics. So it's probably gonna be about um, half the webinar today. I'll look at the basics. And, you know, Aletta and I have had so many sessions on impairment with you over the years um, that I thought what I would actually do is package this in a different way and, and, and actually say, well, what are the 10 practical tips I can give you on impairment at this point in the financial year? Now, where are we in the financial year? It's July. A lot of you will actually be preparing your impairment test for 30 June year ends. And let's face it, we've entered an era of increasing inflation, increasing interest rate environment. So impairment is going to become one of those one of those things again where you'll be doing uh, we'll, you'll be doing forecast and cash flow forecasting in a very different economic environment to the previous year. And in fact, I don't actually remember a time when we had uh, an increasing interest rate environment and an inflationary environment for impairment testing because it's been so long since we've been there. So this is absolutely relevant. And I don't think I need to say to you again that ASIC, once again, is looking at impairment and the carrying value of assets when it comes to um, you know financial statement preparation. Um, I think you'll probably see that again. Uh, I think a letter's in the a letter and the national team are in the process of drafting our corporate reporting newsletter and I, I, I saw it in the early draft. So the next one that comes out, which is probably going to be for July's, has the ASIC focus areas and guess what? Impairment is in there again. So it's all topical at the moment. So let's jump into the basics. Um, I will be covering impairment of non-financial assets um, today, which is really your double ASP 136. But I've sneaked, I've sneaked, I snuck in at, at, at the last minute last night a little bit of financial instruments at the end. But most of this, once again, will be focusing on the non financial assets. And you know what I mean by that. That's goodwill, intangible assets, property planted equipment, right of use assets, those types of assets. And your basic concept of when we're measuring impairment for these, we're mostly doing this for cash generating units. Um, and that means it's a group of assets that's generating inflows, you know, like a little business or a business unit or a division. They, they're generating revenue at some point, and the assets associated with that group of, of, of cash inflows or that, or that revenue is what we're testing for impairment. The basic concept is the group of assets should not be recorded at a carrying amount um, um, 
that is greater than its recoverable amount. And the recoverable amount is higher or fair value, less cost of sales and value in use. Now, traditionally, we're gonna look at value in use and that's who I'm gonna to focus today. This is a basic session. And what I mean by this is there is so much complexity in impairment testing, we cannot possibly cover it all today. So when I actually looked at this um, uh, in the lead up to today's session, I said, what would I tell you if I had 30 minutes, which I do, um, or half a webinar to talk about, you know, practical steps for impairment testing. And I thought, well, let's go back to basics. These are the things that we see over and over that just absolutely floor everybody in impairment testing, which they get wrong. And if you can get these right, then you can build the complexity on top of that. So you can reach out to us or look at your, speak to your auditors or, you know, reach out to us from an advisory point of view to deal with complexity. But the things I'm gonna talk about today are just, you've got to get the basics right. And these are the basic practical tips. On the next slide, a letter, um, uh, it's just a diagrammatical representation of our value in use calc. And as you'll know, the traditional one is a five-year DCF. Now, there's all sorts of variations to this. And, you know, some, some of the resourcing sector, um, impairment testing, or some of the large multinational conglomerates would, would do these slightly different or with more complexity. But most of you out there are going to be doing a five-year DCF, which means uh, one-year cash flow, based on probably management approved budgets, extrapolated out for five years on a forecast basis, there's gonna be a terminal value at the end, a discount rate to present at value at all back to today, and that's what your, your DCF is gonna look like. So I'll be talking basic concepts on a five-year DCF today um, in, in the rest of this presentation. And because I can't do anything without numbers, um, I actually put together a little example um, now, I'll be honest, this is not an example you haven't seen before. For those of you who followed us um, through the years, I do keep coming back to this basic example. It's a good little diagrammatical representation of a basic DCF, and I will show you some tips the, of the trade on how to get the basics right with this. Why I'm showing you this up front is also just to show you the sorts of things that I'd expect to see in a DCF. Now. I'll show you the characteristics for the purposes of today's web webinar on, on this DCF. One thing I'd always say to you, if you're doing a discounted cash flow for value in use, you really should put some historical actuals in it. There's a reason for that. It's not that the historical actuals are actually relevant to the DCF, but it's just good valuation practice to see what the hell's going on. Because uh, a, a discounted uh, cash flow with a budget and forecast period does not exist in a vacuum. It is an continuation of what you've done to date. So in this column, I've got three years worth of historicals, and that's the minus two, minus one, and the zero. Those are the actuals in my little DCF. I've then got a budget period, which is the one year um, forecast period, uh, one, one year forecast uh, period based on management budget. And then I've got two, three, four, and five year are forecast, which is just extrapolating the budget out. Uh, most organizations won't have those with actual formal budgets. That's just taking the budget and building it with a growth rate or some sort of extrapolation factor. Terminal value at the end, discounting it back with a discount rate, and everybody's happy. Now, um, the other thing I've got at the bottom are the assets we're going to be dealing with here. I'm not going to get into the assets today. Today, I'm not going to be talking cash generating units. There's complexity there. And if you're struggling with your cash generating units, you should reach out for assistance with that before you start the DCF. Today, I'm just going to focus on some of the basics. But just for my little example, I've got a brand and some PPE lurking there, a bit of right of use asset because there's some complexity around leasing still. You'll know Aletta and I cannot leave leasing alone. It keeps coming up. Aletta keeps saying it's her favorite thing in the whole world. And that's fine. She loves doing leasing and I love doing leasing too. We do lease accounting for our clients, but it flows through everything right down to impairment. So I couldn't help but put it in there and then some other assets just for fun. Now, this example is not unlike an example we get from a lot of our clients in the first instance. I love this type of DCF. What it, wh why I love this is because often in the budget period, there's this astronomical growth rate in the first year. So if you have a look at my little $900 in the budget, in the budget column, the blue column in the middle, you'll see that we're budgeting $900 worth of revenue and a growth rate of 29%. That, I love that because you know at that point, if you've got a 29% growth rate in your first year, you just know that the people who prepared the budget 
are probably way beyond what's possible or capable. They're already living in la-la land a little bit because that's a big step up in one year, especially in the current environment. And another indicator is when the head their headroom is just a headroom. So if you have a look at the numbers at the bottom of the screen, the headroom in their case is it just ekes in. There's no impairment to the tune of 41, um, 41,000 or, 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 or 41 um, in the case of this impairment model. This is not unlike the, the impairment model we get from a lot of clients and the auditors in particular will get this sort of model. It probably is an indicator that there's risk here, that there actually is impairment and the model has been adapted in some way just to actually you know, get them over the line. So that's why I've put it in here because um, it's a good one to start off, it's a good one to show the sorts of things we generally get. All right, so that's what I'll be talking about as we go. So let's jump into it. 10 practical tips for impairment testing. Now, um, the first thing is this, um, the 10 practical steps for impairment testing. I'll start with tip number one, and that is always start with assets. The reason why I put always in brackets is, I'm sure there's an exception to this rule. So I didn't want to, I didn't want it to be the sort of rule that you should always start with assets because it's not absolute, but generally speaking, I start with assets. And there's a reason for that. When you are doing an impairment testing, what you're actually testing is the carrying value of the assets in the CGU. So it's important to start with those to understand what is your what, what are the assets you're actually working with. Don't start with the budget or the DCF because the thing is, you may actually not even be able to match the two up at the end. Start with the assets. It gives you a good context. Aleta, can you jump to the next slide for me? It'll give you a good uh, context to you know what you're trying to do. It'll also actually build the context of why are we actually doing this impairment test. The aim of an impairment test is to test the carrying amount of the assets. Only the existing assets in the CGU in their current form to generate cash flows, to, ca to generate revenues. The basic concept is this. If we have a look at our, uh, the example I'm working, working with here, we've got brand, PP&E, right of use assets, and some other assets. A CGU impairment test does a discounted cash flow only on what's capable to be generated uh, from a revenue point of view on those assets. You should not be including revenue in your discounted cash flow or cash inflows if, if, if you're generating revenue from assets that haven't been purchased yet. And that is a problem we find with um, uh, impairment testing a lot of the time. We'll get a discounted cash flow and it'll be based on a management budget. And the management budget has got all sorts of growth prospects in there which can't possibly be achieved by the assets that currently exist on the balance sheet. In order to generate the cash flows and the revenue in particular, you'd actually have to go and invest in a whole bunch of new assets or change the, uh, uh, um, the uh, capacity generating ability of the assets that are there. But what we're trying to do is we are trying to test the carrying amount of the group of assets on the balance sheet at the reporting date. And if those assets are limited to a brand, some old PP&E and a couple of rider use assets, then the idea is, is that the DCF you prepare should only be cash flows relevant to those assets in their current form from their efficient use. You should not be building in pie in the sky, um, revenue um, and cash inflow um, budgets and forecasts, which can't possibly be achieved just from those assets. So it's always good to start with the assets first. It also makes it easier to understand later on what's possible from management budgeting. Management budgets, by definition, aren't designed for impairment testing. Management budgets, by definition, are designed to guide the, the, to guide management, to guide the business into the future and to make decisions about what's possible in the future for running the business. But they're not necessarily the same budgets that align with the, with the assets on the balance sheet. So start with the assets that you're trying to do the impairment test and always start with that because it, set, it sets the, concept, uh, the, the, the context for the rest of the test. That's tip one. Tip two is keep it simple, stupid. I wanted to actually put a Put a, put a picture of the band KISS on you, but, but this is a basic concept that we've always been running with is when you design and you build your, your, your impairment test, it does not need to be a complex arrangement or a complex model. So what I've actually done here, I've put some of my, um, my um, tips for what a simple um, impairment test needs to look like. 
it doesn't need to be more complex than the model on the screen. The complexity often isn't in the model, it's in the inputs into the model. So the cash inflows and the assumptions and the assumptions about discount rate, those are the key judgments and assumptions in the model. But keep the model itself simple. I sometimes get goodwill impairment models and it's this enormous Excel spreadsheet with millions of attachment and tabs and sometimes the goodwill model has every possible expense line item listed down. It doesn't need to be that complex. Keep it really simple. First thing is you do not need to do an impairment model that's based on monthly amounts. You often do your budget on monthly amounts for the, for, for the future, you know, monthly budgeted, but the impairment model can be um, aggregated down to uh, years, one, two, three, four, and five. So keep it down to monthly. Second thing is definitely build some growth rates or growth, growth potent, uh, percentage rates in. So working, working clockwise around my little tips here, I started at the top with at, keep it to annual numbers. The second one is build growth rates into the model. Why do I build growth rates in? Because very often you can see straight off the bat whether the numbers you, 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 are, you are using actually make sense. If I look at this, this model already assumes that I've got a 29% growth rate of revenue in the first year and a 22% growth rate of revenue after that. Does that make sense? You can't see that in the numbers, but you can see it in the percentages. And very quickly, if you look at the expense line, I've got a 0% increase in expenses in the first year and a 21% increase in expenses in the second year. Does that make sense? And you can see it very quickly. You don't need monthly numbers to know that, and you don't need to list every expense item to know that. You can just see it in the aggregated numbers straight off the bat. So build some percentage growth rates in so that you can start to assess reasonableness of numbers. The other thing is death and taxes. This is an old debate in accounting standards. The accounting standards do talk about pre-tax cash flows, but it's just silly. I call this the death and taxes. Everybody knows you're going to pay tax on the cash flows and everybody knows it's a fact of life. So let's just rule that out now and take that debate off the table. Leave taxes, don't leave taxes out, it's just silly. The other thing is, is that in any valuation or cash flow analysis, it is irrational to leave out capex and working capital. A lot of the impairment models we still receive today for sort of the small companies or unsophisticated companies will, will, will take the budgeted numbers from um, revenue, other expenses down to EBITDA. Um, they might have some depreciation in there, which then takes them to an income after tax number and then they stop. Well, that's just irrational. In order to generate the cash flows, the inflows and the outflows, you need working capital and you need some replacement or maintenance capex. Please include those in the model. And that gets you down to a free cash flow number, which is used to service equity and debt. We do not include finance cash flows here. Finance cash flows are used to service um, equity and debt. This is a free cash flow from operations, and that's how you calculate your enterprise value. Those are the basic um, principles, and there's nothing complicated here. I'm keeping it simple. A couple other things to remember. Um, discounting period, if you're going to aggregate your model into um, annual numbers, you probably need some sort of midpoint discounting, and you obviously need a discount rate. A discount rate, which is to factor in the market's assessment of the uncertainty in the cash flows. That's a basic DCF. We started with tip one, start with the assets, and understand that the cash flows that you've got in your model align with what those assets can reasonably generate on an efficient use basis. I will actually regale another comment to you, and Aleta and I have actually been having this debate on another client quite recently, um, which has come up. We haven't resolved it yet, it's ongoing. But the question is, what if management want to do something differently with the use of the assets going forward? Now, Aleta, you might want to comment on this. Uh, if you, you'll, you'll know which client I'm referring to. Uh, we won't give more away, but the question is, um, how do you construct your budget? Do you, do you assume a change in the use of the assets in your budgets going forward? And the answer is probably it depends, but it depends on whether the assumptions you're making in the preparation of your budgets actually relate to 
the most efficient use of the assets on a continuing basis. In other words, if you're planning to change the use of those assets going forward, but it doesn't represent an efficient use of the assets and it doesn't represent continuing use, you probably can't take it into account in the cash flows. That's really important, but that's important in the way you set your budget. So how have the budget numbers been put together? Um, the, the particular fact pattern um, at play there is that there's a property at play and I think that they want to do something different with the property. They might be looking at a sale in leaseback or something like that. And those are all financing type decisions. And it's a really complicated question. Are we using the assets in the most efficient way? And are we actually making a finance decision about how we use those assets going forward? The question really is how do we factor that into the cash flows? And the way you factor it in is you've got to keep to the principle of using the assets the most efficient way um, um, for continuing operational use. That's the principle. Um, everything else after that is complexity, but of course those are the sorts of debates that you're going to have in terms of how you set your budget. So keep the budget, keep the impairment model simple so that you can actually have the complex discussions on top of that. Don't overcomplicate your model per se. All right, um, Aleta, you don't have anything to add on that one. I think I've probably covered it. Um, tip number three is be honest about the budget. Protect the discount rate. Now, what do I mean by this? If we go back to our model, and I think I might actually have it. Oh, Alexa, uh, do you mind going back a slide back to back to the model? I'm sorry. I'm actually going to use this to talk about tip three. Be honest about the budget. Once you've put a simple model together and you've built in some growth rates, just like we have here, you will notice already that the percentage increase on revenue in year one and two, as I've mentioned, 29% and 22%, just looks a lot. At this point in the impairment testing, it's time to stand back and say, is my budget really honest? Is this absolutely achievable? And does this represent the capacity and capability of those assets at the bottom to generate those cash inflows? Because what happens at this point is you will be working off management budgets, director approved budgets, and they have, let's face it, directors that directors and managers, they are disruptors. They're the big thinkers and they want to do great things with the business and that's fine. But those management budgets that you start with aren't, aren't always capable of being achieved with this asset base. So at this point in the impairment test, it's time to stand back and say, do those numbers make sense? So this is the tip the tip of be honest with what you're looking at at this point. Don't progress further with the impairment test if the numbers actually just aren't reasonable relative to the assets capability. That's what's relevant. So let's have a look how you do that. At this point, and I think I'm, I'm actually not sure why I'm in the slides, this one, a letter relying on budgets. Most um, people will tell you that in impairment testing, you need to start with budgets that are based on most recent budgets approved by management. That's a sort of a staple of the impairment standard. But what no one tells you is that the accounting standard actually, actually requires five things to be achieved when it comes to the use of budgets in impairment testing. And the fact that they are approved by management is only the first one. Most, or, most people who are preparing impairments just stop at that point. Why it, why it is a requirement that you have management approved budgets is that um, the idea is, is that you're using the most recent economic characteristics that management have taken into account, but also that there's reliability. In other words, management approved this. In other words, they this is part of the business plan, the continuing use. But the standard actually requires somebody rationally to stand back and say, well, hang on, do management actually know how to actually budget in the first place? An approved management budget doesn't mean management actually know how to do an approved uh, management process. So there's four other things you have to do, and these should be documented, and these should be laid before your, your board, and they should also be laid before your auditor when they come, that you've actually established the reliability of the budgeting process. First one is, have management demonstrated their ability to actually forecast accurately? And the way you do that is you actually go back to last year's budget and you say, okay, they did budgeting last year. Did they achieve any of it? Did they actually achieve the budgets last year? And why did they or did they not achieve it? If they actually budgeted last year and they got it wrong, the question is, why did they get it wrong? 
And is that something that they've taken into account in this year's budget process to actually fix the error in the budget process? In other words, do they understand the causes of their budgeting differences? The other thing that is required to be done is, um, are the current year assumptions consistent with the prior year? And if not, have they made adjustments for the current events or circumstances as appropriate? In other words, if management have just applied the same budget processing that they did last year, and they haven't adjusted their management budgets for the fact that we've got increasing interest rates and increasing inflationary and problems with supply chains globally, then they haven't taken into account current events and circumstances. And the question is, why not? And what adjustments need to be made? So those are really the, the characteristics that need to be do. It's not enough to have approved management budgets unadjusted in an impairment test unless the other four things have actually been appropriately uh, dealt with. Ability to budget, um, due diligence on cause and effect for any, any differences in previous budgeting, adjustments for current events and circumstances in the macroeconomic environment, and then management's best estimate. In other words, have they taken the most, possi uh, the, the most reliable um, possibility in terms of the cash flows that is likely to be achieved in the current economic environment? And I would say that there are four economic conditions that I would consider important in the current year budgets. One, increasing inflation. Two, increasing interest rate environment. Three, supply chain problems and four, climate and sustainability risks. And a letter will talk to climate and sustainability risks a bit later, in almost said later in the program. It's like I'm on the ABC giving give, giving the 7.30 report. All right, let's move on to the next one, a letter. Um, so um, is, 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 is understanding the purpose. Now this tip, tip four is understanding the purpose um, is pretty much driven by bringing the, the, the previous three tips together. What is the purpose of an impairment test? The purpose of an impairment test on the right hand side is to test whether the carrying amount of the assets in the CGU are greater than the recoverable amount. It is not to try and see whether management can achieve those budgets according to their business purposes for purposes of ego. What it is, is it's actually a carrying amount assessment. In other words, cash flows must reflect current conditions of the assets but, but linked to the ability of the assets in the CGU to generate those cash flows efficiently. Things that cannot be achieved by those assets should be excluded. And it should include current economic activities, not things that are unlikely to happen. But bearing in mind the purpose is very different to a solvency assessment, it's very different to a going concern assessment, and it's very different to the egos that management might be trying to communicate in their financial statements. Egos, and I call this egos because um, management and uh, often in their financial statements, they'll talk about what they're planning to do to grow the business and they're planning to renew the assets and they're planning to restructure the business. All those things might be relevant to, to actually running the business, but that's not necessarily the purpose of an impairment test, which means the cash flows should probably be adjusted to align the purpose. So understand what the purpose of the impairment test is, understand the capability of the assets, understand the budget and processing and bring it all together. Which leads me to the next tip, which I th actually think is uh, a point and impairment manager. What do I mean by this? Don't let um, egos and political agendas inside a corporation undermine the purpose of the impairment test. The impairment test is really a test of carrying value of assets. So some of the best organizations that get their impairment test right, what they actually do is they delegate um, the impairment test to somebody with authority, but somebody that does not represent some political agenda that maybe the directors might be running or the political agendas that the CEO might be running. They actually are part of often the finance team that actually understand the purpose and can take the various bits and pieces together and build an impairment test that's designed for purpose. So once again, this is a person that can bring together their budget, align it with the purpose of the impairment test, which is carrying them out uh, testing, that has the ability to make adjustments to those budgets to achieve the outcome, and can actually make adjustments to the number for any flaws in the budgeting process 
that don't align with the purpose. Remember the budgets that are prepared are probably for the business to achieve business goals and for the directors and management to run the business. But some of those numbers might be adjusted because we have to bring it back to what are these assets capable of generating. So an impairment manager is essentially somebody that can run the test impartially free of um, political interference in the organization because very often if you get the wrong person running the impairment test they often confuse what the purpose of the impairment test is relevant to running the business and the business purposes so get that person to to, to kind of you know act, um, act, act as an in-betweener to achieve the outcome that's my tip number five it also is my tip number i think it might be my tip number six a letter which is keep calm empower and trust the purpose the impairment manager is the person that calmly adjusts the budget and the impairment test for its purpose, free of the political interference in the organization, and is actually trying to achieve the purpose for which it is designed, which is the carrying amount of those assets in the CGU and nothing else. Let's move on to tip number six. Uh, tip number seven. Tip number seven is don't double count uncertainty. Now, this is really important, and we've been finding this um, in, in a couple of um, tests that keep coming out. It also was something that came up during the COVID period. Um, we've used this in a number of webinars, this, this diagram, and it actually appears in a number of video articles on impairment, and it actually appears in videos um, IFRS in practice on impairment testing, which we'll, we've got a link for you later on at the end of the webinar, which basically is um, understanding how you factored uncertainty into your budget process. A lot of organizations will do a point estimate budget. And what I mean by that is they'll estimate one budget for the next financial year, um, basically trying to achieve either the positive case or the base case that, that aligns with uh, the business purpose. But that's not necessarily aligned with all the possible outcomes in the economic environment. And especially with climate risk and inflation risk and high interest rate and so global supply chain issues, there are a range of scenarios that might possibly align in the first in the budget process. Um, and in this case, let's say I've got four possible scenarios. It's an example of a, of, of a shopping center opening and wine um, shipping to customers. And essentially what, what they've done in this case is they've prepared a budget that has weighted four possible scenarios. If that is how your budget has been prepared, it's important to note that your cash flows probably already factor in uncertainty, which means don't choose a discount rate in your impairment test that double counts the uncertainty. If, however, you've prepared your budget, let's say on only one of these possible scenarios, and it's probably going to be the positive case because that's the one everybody's trying to achieve, then your discount rate is probably going to be higher because you need to factor the uncertainty for the other three scenarios into the discount rate. What I have been seeing recently is a lot of organizations are actually starting to prepare budgets that do factor in the various um, you know, scenarios, in this case, four scenarios, positive and negative scenarios, because they know that we're living in uncertain times. So the economic scenarios are starting to be factored into the budget process, and that's flowing through to the budgets. But what happens then is they use a discount rate that actually hasn't been adjusted for, for that process, and they double counting the uncertainty both in the cash flow budgeting as well as in the discount rate. This is probably the most important. Um, uh, tip I can give you is make sure you understand the dynamic about how the discount rate uncertainty and the budget process uncertainty aligns. It also links nicely to what Aleta is going to talk about later because more and more companies are or should be factoring climate and sustainability risks into their cash flow assessments. So we'll come to that in a while uh, when Aleta takes over. So that, that's, that was my tip number seven. And then tip number eight, and this is, I want to say back to basics, tip number eight, know where your budget ends and your model begins. So I'll go back to my little model again. And very often when impairment um, uh, uh, models are prepared, they're based on, as I said, management approved budgets, but they're often based on management approved budgets just that are income statement budgets. So they start with revenue and they go down to, let's say, profit before tax or, or after tax. But uh, Cash flow forecast is by definition a forecast of cash flows. What would actually be better is if you if you actually base your budget period 
um, on a cash flow forecast, which, are, which includes things like cash flow forecasts for capex and working capital and so forth. Now, very often, as I said, budgets, especially the unsophisticated models and smaller entities models, they'll just do an income statement forecast for the, for the financial year, which means their management budgets, their management approved budgets actually only cover the blue block in the center of the diagram. Everything else is an impairment model assumption. The budgets only cover the, the, middle bit, uh, the middle bit in blue down to the income after tax. And the way you need, the way we can often see that is they, they, that, that, that the, the model actually has what I call the four cash flow areas of the apocalypse based on the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Because very often you can have a perfect management budget down to income after tax, and then you break your impairment model because your, your cash flows haven't been adjusted for the, for the fact that they haven't been based on management budgets. And I'll show you the four cash flow um, uh, apocalypse errors. Um, yeah, they are. One is, and I'll start from the bottom. Um, very often, if your management of budgets have been approved and there's a massive big growth, let's say of 29% in the revenue number, there's no way that only um, working capital adjustments based on previous years, working capital changes will be appropriate. And you can see very quickly when the budget has stopped at the income after tax, but the cash flow forecast below that haven't been adjusted to match the budget. You'll see it in a very um, irrational working capital adjustment that does not factor changes in operations. So let's assume your operations are growing and you've got 30% growth coming in the, in the next financial year. And let's assume that's appro appropriate for impairment testing, working capital, um, investment will have to increase to support that. And that's the same with the CapEx. CapEx will have to be increased some way to maintain that level of revenue increase. I'm not talking about um, restructuring capital. I'm just talking about capital uh, CapEx to maintain the growth in the numbers. And you can see very quickly if the if the budget ended at the income after tax number, you'll see very quickly the CapEx often doesn't match once again the scale of operations in, in in the forecast. So that's one of those are the some of the two key areas that we often we can often see where 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 the budget and the cash flow analysis don't align. The other thing is um, the capex to depre depreciation ratio. This is actually one this is actually not complex but it's something you want to have a look at. If we look at the numbers that are on the screen right now, if you look at the plant and equipment number 350 down at the bottom of the screen, that means we've got uh, PP&E of 350, and if you look at my PP&E depreciation higher up in the budget, you can see that I got a number of 50 um, in the budget period and in the forecast period. That means I'm depreciating my 350 plant and equipment at $50 um, a year, it means I'm going to fully depreciate that, that item of PP&E by, by the time I hit the terminal year. But look at my CapEx number, I've only got four, which means I'm actually not replacing my PP&E, so it doesn't make sense. But it also means I'm going to keep depreciating my PP&E into the terminal year, into perpetuity, but I've already hit a zero working book value at the end of, the, uh, end of year five, which means I'm actually going to have negative depreciation on PP&E that doesn't exist into the future. That is one of the quickest ways to identify that your budget and your cash flows in the forecast period don't align. The assumption is wrong. You're going to have to replace that PPE somehow through CapEx, but it also means just do a very basic PPE test to decide whether you've actually just pushed your PPE into negative PPE territory in the terminal year because the depreciation in the terminal year keeps going, but there's no replacement in CapEx. All right. Those are sort of the three basic apocalypse errors when it comes to marrying your um, budget and your PP&E, uh, uh, your budget and your forecast cash flows. The last one is the tax shields. Have a look at the tax number just just uh, just in, the, in in that forecast. It's probably based on 30% of the of the EBITDA number or or the 30% of the profit before tax number. The problem with that is is that it doesn't take um, future deductions for capex into account because if you add capex in you're going to get deductions of those into the future and it hasn't taken it in but it also probably doesn't factor in things like base rent and uh, base rent in this case you'll see my base rent has been taken out because I've got right of use assets on my balance sheet and so I've taken my rental out of my cash flow 
but that doesn't mean you don't get the tax for the for the rent so make sure you put those things back i call those tax shield adjustments the tax isn't just a straight 30 percent on profit it's a 30 percent of the things you're entitled to and there's actually benefit there so that's another thing where your budgets and your cash flows don't align if that didn't quite make sense, happy for you to reach out. We're going to have a conversation online, um, but there's a bit of complexity in there and there's often lost opportunity in the tax because you haven't aligned your cash flow assumptions on capex and rentals um, in with your budget and your forecast. All right, I'll jump to the next thing because um, I think I've gone over my time already. Uh, tip number nine is to accept that right of use assets are a financing decision. Um, with the adoption of lease accounting, um, you would have noticed that right of use assets do actually appear in the cash generating unit in my little, little test, which means that we've actually assumed that that is a right to use that asset and the lease liability is um, actually a financing decision. I've seen lots of organizations try to add back the rental and try and, they try and manipulate their um, their forecast to try and go back to the old way of do, doing lease accounting by saying, well, the base rent, I do actually have to pay rent and I need to put it back into my free cash flow and all that sort of thing. And what ends up happening is they double count not only the cash flows for base rent by trying to add them back, but also they suddenly have a right of use asset which double counts the investment into their rent. Long story short is it's time to accept that right of use assets is actually a financing decision, that the lease liability is a debt instrument, and those rental payments that relate to any recognized lease liability need to come out of the model. The lease liability slide that, that's on you now, probably not that important. It's basically just the theory behind don't double count cash flows from, from leasing where you've already capitalized the right of use asset on the balance sheet. We have done webinars on this. Last year, we actually did a whole webinar on this and I'm happy for you to go back and have a look at that. We also have a number of articles um, that deal with um, leasing and impairment testing um, in our corporate reporting newsletter. So I'll jump over the slide, I'll let her move forward. Um, tip number 10 is don't forget your expected credit loss on receivables. So I'm just jumping straight out of um, our um, uh, non-financial asset impairment testing. I'm saying don't forget that you need to actually focus a little bit on your um, receivables and also your other loans and receivables expected credit lossing um, but I'm specifically focusing in this uh, webinar on receivables because everybody generally has trade receivables um, this is generally how a lot of organizations will do uh, 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 their, their expected credit lossing for for the receivables they'll do a loss rate based on aging, we call that a simplified approach for receivable, and you'll work out a historical default rate, and you'll work out how that applies to your aging, and essentially you'll work out your loss allowance, or a lot of organizations will call that the old provision for doubtful debts, but it's actually a loss allowance, it's slightly different. This is how you will do it, and because we've got a change in economic environment this year, it is true that the expected loss rates are probably going to start to factor a little bit more risk of default into it you know, rising interest rates, um, rising inflation. But how do you do that? The way to do that is to actually not treat your receivables as one big portfolio. It is actually time for you to start to look at your, port uh, to break your trade receivables into, into portfolios, because different portfolios have different risk profiles. You do need to actually think about doing that. Um, you know, diff different diff different sectors of the economy will have different risks attaching to them. So one of the ways you'd actually want to start to consider how to take into account the, the expectation of future conditions like rising interest rates and inflation is to actually break your receivables into portfolios. But the other thing is to actually give more weight to trends or outcomes that you might have seen in the past. Everyone is freaking out a little bit about rising interest rates and inflationary environments that is actually starting to increase the risks of defaults so or higher default rates. But it is also true that there is an enormous amount of savings that are sitting in some bank bank balances. People are some entities are flush, flush with cash, and I keep hearing on the ABC and whoever it is that I'm listening to uh, the economist economists talking on 
on TV, they keep they keep saying like there is say a lot of savings. People has been saving during the pandemic, so there is money in the system. So it is true that yes, the risk has increased, but you should fa counter that by the ability of organisations to pay. And if you break your your expected credit loss into portfolios, you may actually see those counter indicators in the portfolios. And it doesn't actually mean that all portfolios are going to have an increase in their expected loss rates. Um, I won't have, I won't talk through this. Um, uh, I'll, I'll actually just leave it there because I do want Alessa to actually talk a little bit about climate um, and sustainability risks. So I'll leave it at that, Aletta, and turn it over to you. Um, I think I've covered my top 10 um, risks to factor, uh, uh, top 10 um, impairment testing factors, Aletta. Over to you on okay. climate and sustainability. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Kevin. I find that very interesting, very useful, and I know it's something that a lot of our clients are grappling with at the moment. You know, putting that impairment test together for the for the auditors to have a look at uh, as well. Um, you know, <coughs> around cl climate change and sust sustainability, we know the landscape is moving really fast. Um, and BDO has been running separate webinars where we're looking at sustainability and ESG, and we've been focusing on helping clients to prepare their first sustainability report. However, I think a lot of people have told us that um, they like the idea of issuing a sustainability report for the same period, so FY22 up to 30 June 2022. And they like the idea of issuing it at the same time as the audited financial statements. However, um, a run out of time, you know, a lot of competing priorities and therefore potentially for 30 June 2022, they're not going to get to that separate uh, sustainability report. So let's say next year, because at the moment it's still voluntary. Um, so we've got the option to delay. However, that made me think that there is a problem, and that is that climate and sustainability factors could have an impact on the actual numbers in the audited financial statements. And one of the clearest ways to see that is if you think about useful lives of your assets, or if you think of potential impairment of your assets, um, if you think about liabilities that you might need to book because you have decommissioning liabilities uh, when you finish mining a site, etc., all those things, although they are linked to climate risk, linked to sustainability, and might not be in your fancy sustainability report this year, still has to be considered as indicators of impairment uh, for impairment testing. So it can't be ignored for 30 June 2022 financial statements. I think that's the key message. Um, so to explore that a bit further, um, as you know, we've had our webinar series just last week. We looked at finalising the sustainability report. And on the 15th of July, I spoke extensively on if you're not going to do that sustainability report for 2022, what do you need to consider for your actual audited financial statements? And then next month, we're talking about assurance over your ESG report. So if you've done it and you're looking at some level of assurance, how do you go about that? And all those recordings are available. I also want to flag that BDO is sponsoring an ESG summit in Melbourne next week. Um, I'll be leading a panel discussion. Um, and the panel discussion is, again, how do you collect and manage data for ESG reporting? benchmarking your performance, et cetera. Um, so if you're interested in that, please have a look and I've got the, the links there. The other thing that we're seeing a lot about at the moment is a lot of regulators are coming out and saying, we would like to encourage entities to consider climate related risks. Um, and although there's no mandated way to do it at the moment, um, the regulators are supporting the TCFD disclosures. Um, now, when they came up with all their regulations, there were no International Sustainability Standards Board, which was only established end of last year. But if they are supporting the TCFDs, they are in actual fact 
supporting the standards issued by <coughs> the newly established ISSB because the TCFD disclosures have already been incorporated into the ISSB disclosures. And there's also a warning that if you want to make statements in your financial statements, anywhere in the financial report actually, be mindful of greenwashing. So we cannot set targets, make commitments, make statements on how we deal with these risks and opportunities around climate and broader sustainability um, if we don't actually have in, um, in place a plan to achieve those targets and objectives. Um, so we can't say things without the substantiation behind it. Um, so I've put in a few extracts just to remind you uh, of the things we have to look at. Now, remember I've said earlier, um, climate change and sustainability risks, uh, there's no mandatory requirement um, to have a sustainability report. There's no mandatory requirement necessarily to have it in the financial statements. Um, however, what we do have is the, the link with the financial statements, the link with the financial numbers. So ASIC in their focus areas for 30 June 2022 specifically listed that in the operating and financial review, which goes with our audited financial statements as part of the annual report, um, that we should explain how organisations manage their risks and opportunities, their strategies, their future prospects, and they refer to Regulatory Guide 247 about effective disclosure in an open, operating and financial review. Um, and recently, when ASIC published the um, findings of the uh, financial statements they've reviewed, um, there was a large number of inquiries they've made around disclosures in the OFR. So they've got a real focus of, on this operating and financial review, and they refer to climate risk in there. Um, if you look at extracts from that media release, you can see on the bullet point on the right-hand side at the bottom, climate change could have material impact on future prospects of an entity. Therefore, impact impairment testing, right? Read it that way. And directors may also consider whether to disclose um, that would be relevant under the recommendations of the TCFD. Um, you know, so this is a strong recommendation from ASIC to understand that and to consider that. Um, so there's a number of extracts, uh, parts that I've extracted, but I think it's important to note that it's on ASIC's radar um, and their expectation is at least disclosure in, in the OFR, but a serious consideration of what you've disclosed in the o OFR would mean for your asset values and liabilities. Um, there's also an increased focus on greenwashing and there's a number of uh, publications on that, which I've just flagged for you. Um, in the information sheet 271, they talk about how to avoid greenwashing when offering or promoting sustainability related products. And again, they talk about the TCFD disclosures. Um, so a real focus. Um, ASIC has done a bit of research or a review of climate risk disclosures by Australian listed companies. And I've given you a link there to that report. Um, fascinating report. Um, they've looked at climate risk disclosures um, by 60 of the ASX 300 entities. They've looked at disclosures in IPOs um, and across 15,000 annual reports. And I've got some of the findings here for you. Um, and basically they're saying we would like you to consider clim climate risk, how it links to your business, um, disclose how you monitoring it, disclose what your governance is. Um, and therefore, again, they say you should consider the TCFD disclosures um, and consider putting it into your OFR. So all the same messages and their research actually support uh, their recommendations. So that's an interesting read. Um, there's also um, some movement by another regulator, and that is APRA, uh, where they've issued a uh, a guidance document, Prudential Practice Gu um, Guide CPG 229, Climate Change Financial Risks. 
Um, again, they recommend disclosure around risks, risk management, uh, governance. Um, they say you should consider the TCFD recommendations. And, and remember, these documents were issued, I think this one was in 2019. Um, so, sorry, this one is a recent one, November 2021. The ASIC one was in 2018 or 2019. But when this document was issued again, there was no International Sustainability Standards Board yet. Um, so they recommend the TCFDs, which are now included in the International Sustainability Standards Board um, rec, um, exposure draft. Now, the ASX have also issued um, a, an update to their corporate governance principles and recommendations, the fourth edition um, in February 2019. Um, and again, they've said that you should consider um, in, in recommendation 7.4, um, they, encourages, they encourage entities to consider whether they have material exposure to climate-related risks by reference to the TCFD recommendations. And if they do have those climate-related risks, make the disclosures recommended by the TCFD. And remember, consider how it impacts your asset values in your balance sheet. Consider how it um, impacts the liabilities that should be recognised. Um, so. I've just quickly shown you, you know, from the ASX, from APRA, from ASIC, um, the, the big move towards considering sustainability related risks and disclosures. So it's not mandatory yet, but there's a recommendation, there's a movement. And then the AASB um, earlier this year issued ED3 to 1, and they've asked for comments on um, the first two standards issued by the newly established International Sustainability Standards Board. Now, IFRS S1 that look at the general requirements is really very informative because it's saying, uh, don't get fixated, uh, fixated on climate risks. Think about sustainability risks and how those would impact your business model. So think broader than, um, than climate risk. And then in standard S2, it's really a duplicate of what the TCFD had had in the past. And that's say, OK, we know climate risk is on everybody's mind. It's a big risk. It impacts asset values. Um, this is what we believe you should be disclosing around climate related risk. And they will be issuing S3 onwards on other sustainability related matters. Um, important, the fact that there isn't a specific standard dealing with other sustainability matters um, doesn't mean you can ignore it. Um, the general requirements standard actually captures the whole lot, similar to the conceptual framework uh, that we have in accounting. Um, so there's a lot of movement. I also just wanted to talk about ESG and sustainability reporting options. Um, you know, and this is just a simple diagram that I've thrown together to maybe articulate the difference between an annual financial report or the, the glossy that we've referred to in the olden days, as opposed to financial statements. Um, because whenever I speak to ESG and sustainability people, they, they use financial report and financial statements interchangeably. And I don't think they always understand why there's a very important difference between the two. Because if you talk about financial statements, you talk about your profit and loss, balance sheet, cash flow, all the things required by AASB 101. And those financial statements are the subject of a director's declaration that they true and fair and in accordance with accounting standards. And those financial statements are subject to an audit report, which is reasonable assurance. But then in the broader glossy or financial report, we will find a director's report, which could include um, a remuneration report. Um, we could have in that glossy an operating and financial review. We could have a sustainability report in future. We could have the chairman's report. Now, all those other documents are not necessarily subject to audit, similar to financial statements, but because they accompany the financial statements, the auditors will read them to identify whether there's inconsistencies or not. So, you know, where you put your sustainability information is actually important. If it's in this other part, 
um, it's not necessarily directly subject to audit, but if you embed it in the financial statements, it's subject to audit. Um, you know, so where you place it and whether it's accompanying or not is important. Um, and then I've identified three alternatives. You can have sustainability information as part of your audited financials, if you can withstand that reasonable assurance on it. Um, you could put it as part of the broader report um, and issue it at the same time, which I must say is my preference. Um, or you could it outside the financial report at another date at another time, completely separate, which um, you know I think is 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 maybe difficult. Um, you know, and you know, users might struggle with that. There's no right or wrong. There's three different ways. However, and this is the key message: doesn't matter which option you follow here. You still have to consider all these uh, the sustainability risks and climate risks in your audited financial statements because it impacts value of assets. It impacts potential recognition of liabilities. So, you know, don't confuse the two. Don't say I've decided to put the sustainability information in a separate report and now I can move on. No, no, no. For 30 June 2022, financial statements, you still have to think about this. Um, so we've run out of time. Um, I've included some further information to explain the interconnectivity between financial reporting and sustainability reporting, um, specifically using climate risk as an example. Um, I've explained it in last week's ESG webinar, if you want to look at that. Again, trying to articulate how this impacts financial statements, where's the overlap between sustainability standards and financial statements because there's an interconnectivity, there's an overlap. And then I've also tried to make an argument that I think there's an expectation gap between what investors are expecting and what the standards require. And therefore, we're currently supplementing um, the accounting standards with the standards issued by the International Sustainability Standards Board. Um, We've got a lot of free resources to help you, and I think the most important one is we've got e-learning on TCFD disclosures, which is recommended by all these regulators. So if you want to find out more about these TCFDs that should be considered for 30 June 2022 reporting, um, you know, whether it's in the financials or just in the financial report, you can find out more. Um, it's in Corporate Reporting Insights. Um, we've got a website with a lot of information and at BDO, we've got a number of partners that focus on sustainability and ESG um, in particular. Um, but as Kevin has uh, said earlier, um, we have a topic page uh, where we've got all things in payment, which um, Kevin talked through, um, you know, articles, e-learning, webinars, the whole lot. Um, we've got a, a really amazing publication issued by BDO Global on um, impairment of uh, non-financial assets. Um, we've got uh, amazing global resources uh, on our website as well. Um, obviously, we've got our, our six leaders that you can contact, as well as our broader team. Um, so, Kevin, that was a real fast uh, flyover of climate risk and sustainability. Um, but, you know, I was just with all the media around it and all the regulators uh, putting out um, newsletters and, and focus, I think it was important to put it on the agenda as people finalise their financials. So thank you very much and I hope you all have a lovely day. Thank you. Goodbye. Thanks, Kevin. Bye bye.